was born in Glasgow, Scotland. He studied theology and psychology. He was provincial of the Marist province of West Central Europe between 2010 and 2019. He was co-edited several books about children's safeguarding and he, he is member of the Care and Protection Commission of the International Union of Superiors General. On Wednesday, when I introduced Brother Manuel, I told you, let's talk about holiness. Today I have to repeat again, let's talk about holiness. In the face of the issue of children abuse, and it's not a crazy idea. When we talk about virtues, we have to talk about justice and prudence. And in the Institute, it was always been suggested that we act with prudence and justice. So today, it also relates to holiness. Let's give a nice applause to the brother Brendan. Thank you, Guillermo. When I prepared this presentation, I had a delightfully bland title, and Michael Green said to me, Brendan, can you come up with something a bit more interesting? <laughs> <laughs> and I happened to be reading a chapter in A Vie de Sans Sentences Instruction, which I'm sure is not a book many of us rush to read, where Father Champagne said, I don't like teachers who are executioners. That seemed like a good title for my presentation. Two things I want to say at the beginning. This presentation is about abuse, including sexual abuse. And anybody who does presentations in this knows that in a large group like this, there will be people who have had some kind of connection with this subject in some way. If anything that you hear causes any distress or any concern, make sure you talk to somebody afterwards. Don't sit on it. Uh, I'll be around. There's many, many fine people here. But don't be disturbed or distressed because of this topic. The second thing is, while I studied history, I'm not basically a historian. And I have benefited from many conversations with Michael Green over the years about aspects of Marist history. But in the last month, Andre Lanfrey generously has been in communication with me about aspects of the history that relate to this presentation. So I want to acknowledge the assistance I've had from both of them, documents they've shared, and other things. The other thing I want to say by way of preface is that I'm going to talk about aspects of Marist history and some across the, the years of our history. I have not done a, a deep systematic study of abuse in the Institute. I think it would be a huge thing to try. But also, I tried to imagine what it would be like if I contacted a provincial or archivist and said, please tell me about the history of abuse in your province. I think it would be experienced as intrusive and possibly hurtful to do that. <coughs> so that. What I have done, I benefited from my knowledge of the countries where I was provincial, which is Ireland, Scotland, Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. Things I've heard, documents I've read, things people have shared with me, and as some will know, in Australia there was a Royal Commission which did an investigation into ourselves as well as others and produced a report. In Scotland there was a Scottish abuse inquiry which I attended on behalf of the brothers. That's a public document. And in Ireland there was also an audit which is public. So I've made use of those materials as preparation for this. But I, don't, I have no desire to embarrass anyone or to, to shock, but I do think we need to look at our history. I've asked John Klein to help me today 
because I've actually made lots of quotations from documents. And rather than listen to my voice only, I've asked John to read them so that you have a bit more variety in the presentation. Also, when you need a quotation, you tend to rush, which doesn't help the translators. This way, John can speak in his measured way. In 2017, at the general chapter, in his address, Brother Emini said, we have all received a wonderful inheritance from 200 years of history, full of lights, but also with its shadows. Today's presentation is not going to be about the lights for the most part. It's going to be looking at some of our shadows. Let's put this in perspective. The vast majority of Maoists, brothers, priests, sisters, have cared for children and have made their lives better. Sadly, some of our members did not do that. I think we need to look at our shadows and not just the light, the same as we do in our own lives. Emilia also said, as an institute, an in-depth study be carried out of possible causes that gave rise to and enabled the abuse that happened in alarming numbers in some places. <coughs> some people know that I'm actually involved in a research project with four Australian brothers and four former brothers who abused children to help us understand how this ever happened. And I have great admiration for the leadership of the Australian Brothers and those who have cooperated with that so that we can have a little bit more insight into what happened. What I'm going to do today is also part of a possible study from the point of view of history. When I studied history way back in 1980, one of the professors said, the reason we study history is to look at the remarkable <coughs> achievements that human beings can do, <coughs> the strengths, the capacities, but also to look at the terrible things <coughs> that human beings are capable of. And I think we have to have the courage to do both. So that's what I'm looking at today. <coughs> the focus of the presentation, three things. Father Champagne's care for children and what he taught the brothers. What happened to his teaching and values in subsequent marriage tradition, based on the limited knowledge I have? And I want to say something about recent Superior General and the General Chapter and the Sexual Abuse Crisis. If you look at safeguarding today, policies deal with four areas. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect. In September 2021, I was asked to go to Athens to do presentations to the two very, very fine Marist schools in the city. And we had never done any pre presentations about abuse. Since they were Marist schools, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take something from the life of Father Champagne, which illustrated what I was saying. And as I did that, it was actually very easy to find examples for each of those four major areas. And I thought, this is really interesting, because Father Champagne, to use an English expression, ticks all the boxes that we look to in terms of safeguarding. And I realised there was an important story there and perspective for us as Marists about our founder and what he passed on to the brothers. So I'm now going to go through those four areas with the assistance of John to show what our tradition says about Father Champagne. I'll share a little about what happened to that tradition afterwards, which is part of the shadows that I was talking about. Then I'll go on to the present day. So let's start with physical abuse 
which, as we know from the, the life of Father Champagne, was the first time, to your knowledge, that he encountered this. On his first day of attendance, he was very timid. The teacher vigorously boxed the ears of the child who wanted to read first. Marcelin was shaking all over and was more inclined to cry than to read. He was indignant at this cruel act and he refused to have anything to do with this man's lessons, still less with his punishments. <clears throat> okay, we're all familiar with this story, and according to the Jean Baptiste version, Father Champagne refused to go back to school. I always found that a bit suspicious, trying to think how parents would accept that, and Andre Lanfrey has said in the history that he probably went to school for two years, but that's a more dramatic and effective story. What is interesting is we know that Father Champagne took a great deal from the educational thinking of St. John Baptiste de La Salle. So I looked up and I found it on the internet the teaching of Jean Baptiste de La Salle about physical punishment. And in a book called The Conduct of the Christian Schools, it was published in 1720. I gathered there were lots of subsequent editions. I haven't checked them all. I'm presuming this stayed the same. De La Salle allowed the use of the Peru. That was a little leather strap for hitting the child's hand for minor misdemeanors. And the use of the rod or the cane for more serious offences. It is said, these connections should be administered with great moderation. I'm not quite sure how you hit a child with moderation, Ellen, <laughs> and presence of mind. Ordinarily, no more than three blows should be given. If it's sometimes necessary to go beyond this number, never more than five should be given without a special permission from the director. It's worth holding in mind the words moderation, the number, and the permission, because they return in our history later on. But what is interesting to me, given how much Father Champagne borrowed from the La Salle, like the simultaneous method, he clearly read this and said, I'm not having this. This is not going to be part of what Baptist brothers do. And I must go to ask John to read from the life of the founder, which is in the next two slides, John. Okay. It is by striking them with the cane, queried the founder that children are to be brought up and inspired with the love of virtue? No. It is convincing reasons and religious motives and not punishments that persuade the mind and change the heart. It is strange that in the education of children, methods are used that would be considered unsuitable even in the case of animals. If we want to tame or break an animal, we are careful not to maltreat it. On the contrary, it is treated with kindness and caresses. The curb is used only with prudence and caution. So opposed was he to corporal punishment that he even made efforts to prevent it happening accidentally or in an unguarded moment of irritation. For this reason, the pointers used to indicate letters and numbers or reading and arithmetic charts were to be attached with a string, making it impossible to strike the children with them. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Father Champagne did not think that at all. That has to be the result of experience. He must have been aware of brothers using the cane to hit children, said, OK, I need to bring a stop to this. I remember when I was in Cameroon, there was a, an English Bill Hill priest in charge of the cathedral. And he decided there were lots of housekeepers 
as a kind of symbol of their role, he gave them a kind of baton thing. After a few weeks, he had to take it off them because they were using it to hit the prisoners. <laughs> There's something very tempting for some men, if you give them a stick, to hit people. <laughs> so Father Champagne knew that. Now, I was not aware of this until Ben Kinsigli pointed out to me. So this part of our tradition, I had no idea about. And my guess is lots of other people didn't know it too. But to me, what's important is Father Champagne giving an example from his farming background. We don't assault animals. Why would we hit children? And then clearly he saw brothers using the cane to hit children and said, tie it to the wall with a chain. Don't even be tempted. What is interesting, and again I'm grateful to Brother Andre for this, the general chapter of 1852 to 54 was very, very important in the history of the Institute for codifying a lot of the educational and religious thought of this young congregation. And the use of the Firu was the most contentious issue. In the minutes of that chapter, we read, the article in which the Ferrell was tolerated, notice the word, was hotly contested. 18 votes to 4. What's interesting, there were lots of votes where there were four people who opposed things. Clearly there was a minority in that chapter <laughs> that was not happy with lots of things going on. But what's also interesting in the minutes, the issue was returned to before the end of the chapter. So this small group did not let go of the issue, wanted to reopen it, and of course, when people try that, chapters don't like it, and they didn't succeed. So at that moment, 1852 to 54, the congregation in chapter turned its back on this aspect of the inheritance of Marcelin Champagne. I'm going to ask John to read from the teacher's guide. Again, Brother Jean Baptiste wrote that, and you can see the tension in him trying to be faithful to the spirit of the founder but respect the authority of the chapter. It will never be permitted to use it for anything other than a single blow to the middle of the left hand. This penance must be rare and will never be given to small children or to those whose hands hurt. This kind of correction is not authorized in our schools. It is only tolerated. And it is highly desirable that the brothers be able to do without any kind of afflictive punishment. They are especially forbidden to hit pupils with their hands or feet, with a stick or a signal, to pull their ears or hair, to pinch, hit, or push them roughly. Thanks, John. Notice one blow, not three, not five, and the tension between authorized and tolerated. In English, we call that a mixed message. It's an ambiguous message about what's going on there. And that was part of the inheritance. And all those things at the bottom, hitting with hands or feet, nobody sat and made them up. They clearly were things that people had experienced. Just a brief mention of some things in Maoist history. The brothers came to London at the invitation of the mother's fathers in 1852 to look after children in the East End that did not have any school. And Brother Clare, who wrote the history, said there were these undisciplined children of Irish backgrounds that the brothers were trying to create into a school. Now he doesn't mention physical punishment. I'm fairly sure it was used because that was a tradition in Britain and Ireland at that time. The brothers went to Australia in 1872, and Michael Green has been very generous in sharing with me 
that physical punishment was a real issue. That's a bust of Brother Ludovic, who was the first brother, the French brother in Australia, and he was horrified at the way his Irish and British confreres hit the children. It's not difficult to understand why. A group of unruly children, and there's nothing like hitting them to get a bit of order. But in fact, it was so bad that it was reported to Bishop or Archbishop, who called Brother Ludovic to say, look, some of these reports of your brothers are not very, very attractive. You need to calm down some of your brothers. I accidentally came across a letter from Canada that Colin sent me to do with the Foundations of Britain, where the provincial wrote to the assistant in Rome, and among other things, mentioned a brother who had been removed from teaching because of physically hitting pupils. And in time-honored Marist tradition, he was sent to be a cook in a community. But John mentioned to me the other day, there are two cases from this period of lawsuits against brothers in Canada for hitting children. I'm sure there's other examples. But I want to also mention two examples where the Champagne tradition was not forgotten. Brother Ligori was an Irishman who was head teacher in Dundee in 1931. And Brother Ligori was a very strong man. He became provincial in 1936 and was provincial for 10 years because of the Second World War. His nickname in Dundee was Bella Ligosi, who was an actor who was a kind of in horror films. <laughs> so he was a very strong man, Brother Ligori. And remember, for, for great achievements, but he said in the first page of the annals, which I read by accident again, he said, I want to propose a system of discipline without physical punishment. So he had inherited the tradition and wanted to have a, a system without it. I taught in that school in the 1980s, and the tradition got lost somewhere. Another brother in Germany was working in the archives, and he found a letter from a group of men who got together 70 years after a school they attended. The brothers were removed in 1937 when the Nazis took the brothers' schools away from them. And they said that it was a reformatory for boys who got into trouble. 1930s Germany, not exactly a place of pastoral care and compassion. The brothers replaced the emphasis of subordination by taking the hand of the child. And that was remembered 70 years after the brothers left, that the way the brothers ran the school was different from what they had before. I, I never read the Common Rule of 1960. I went to the university in 1975. But I had to present it to the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry because they wanted to know the history of the brothers. And I found there the brothers are absolutely forbidden to strike their pupils because such forms of corporal punishment do not lack of self-control. Often brothers are anybody hits children in anger, feeling the respect due to the pupil, a sense of the rights of a child, and are opposed to Christian charity, to the dignity of the religious educator, and to the wishes of the parents. That last line is sadly not always true. I know that some of our brothers in Africa have actually said the parents wanted the brothers to punish their children with canes, etc. And the brothers said, no, and do not. And at the Scottish Abuse Inquiry, Lady Smith, who was the lawyer presiding, said, and it's in her report, if the Manus brothers had that in their room in 1960, they were ahead of the rest of the world. Sadly, they were not faithful to their tradition. Just a few commissions of investigation. In Ireland, 2016, there was one single allegation of physical abuse. The Australian report, case study, talks about occasions when there was excessive, cruel and unreasonable punishment. And Lady Smith said in Scotland, I'm satisfied that the regimes enabled some brothers to physically abuse children. 
I'm not trying to rub on those in a, in a standish way to say our tradition was pretty clear from our founder. Sadly, some brothers and some regimes did not respect our inheritance. Fortunately today, with our new marriage standards of safeguarding, we've gone back to the founder. Physical punishment and the use of humiliating or degrading language or other such ways of dealing with minors are prohibited. Post on. Let me move on to emotional abuse. Father Champagne told the brothers that they should never give a child a nickname as he saw the damaging consequences of this on some of his fellow students. As we know, whenever there is physical or sexual abuse, there's also emotional abuse. And again, I say this with great sadness, Lady Smith in Scotland dedicated six pages of her report to the emotional abuse of children by mothers' brothers. It might seem a lot to hang emotional abuse on, the fact that Father Champagne was opposed to nicknames, but if we look at the rule of 1837, he develops it a bit more. A brother will not use the intimate form of address to his fellows, and not even to the children. No one shall be called by a nickname. The teacher's guide instructs the brothers to refrain from sarcastic expressions and from taunting pupils on account of their physical defects or the status of their parents. In fact, from all forms of offensive illusion. And that comes straight from Father Champagne. He knew the impact of these things on children. When I was, when I was 13, a brother tried to give me a nickname, which I didn't like. But I realized, if I answer this, I will have this name for a long time. So what I did was, when he tried to use it, and others did, I ignored it. And it worked. Two days later, nobody used it. Not everyone has the presence of mind I had. I knew this was the best way not to have it. But I also know of other situations where nicknames have stuck and have caused hurt for a long time. But the key thing is not nicknames. It's an awareness of emotional abuse and how it can damage children. And I want to go on to the more difficult subject of sexual abuse. John, can you this, please? During the Lavala period, 1817 to 1825, children were accepted as boarders. A postulant yielded to a temptation of this kind. A similar fault was committed by a 25-year-old postulant the founder learnt of it at 10 o'clock in the evening, but made him get up and dismissed him immediately. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. John. Brother Andre Lanfrey has pointed out that the second part of the life suffers from a certain <clears throat> ahistorical approach. You don't know when in Champagne's life these events happened. But in these two instances, he gives the time of day. The Lavala period we know, and we also know that the postulate was at the Hermitage, the second one, so we actually can date it reasonably accurately. Also, Brother Sylvester mentions it in his memoir. So we have got convalidating information about this. And to me, what's interesting is, as soon as Father Champagne discovered it, he responded with alacrity. And he was annoyed because some other postulants knew about it before they told him. What's also interesting is that when the Father Champagne's cause of beatification was being proposed, the devil's advocate used these two instances as examples of Father Champagne's lack of compassion and sensitivity. Nowadays we'd be using him as a poster boy for safeguarding because he actually acted quickly. Brother Basilio, in his circular on the spirit of the Institute, said, we might not want to follow Father Champagne in just dismissing somebody. Nowadays we want to offer therapy, etc. 
fair enough. But for 1824-1830, it's pretty impressive that he actually did something to protect children. In A View Les Sons as well as Father Chapanga saying he doesn't like brothers who are executioners, he said, I don't like brothers who are nannies. And again, in correspondence with Andre, the translation is not great. Because they lack dignity, they caress the children suggestively and spoil their character. I remember seeing a brother when I was about 20, 21, <coughs> preparing for Mass and he was helping them to be altar boys and he was kind of touching their backs and their heads and it was creepy, <laughs> it was just really unpleasant to see. It was in full view, his, his boy's father was there, but it came to mind when I read this from Father Shampanga. They, they caressed the children suggestively and they think that for Father Shampanga was not acceptable. Now for the members of the Society of Mary who are here, I've decided to include this which is a letter from Father Crowland to Father Champagne, and October 1837, and I'll get John to read it. Remember that the brother that I ask of you will continually be among the children who come from good families, and that being the case, he has to have a certain bearing and have an education. He should also have good handwriting, and be beyond reproach in the moral area because he will be sleeping in the children's dormitory and will be obliged to be available to, available to them at any moment and that demands proven virtue from him. Now, leaving aside a certain snobbery in Father Kulan's part and the kind of brother he wanted for his parents, what's interesting is the awareness that for a brother to be in the dormitory, there were dangers. Now, I've done lots of study about the whole issue of sexual abuse, and it's very clear that what they call opportunity is clearly a factor. So if you look at the Australian data, the three orders which had the most, the highest percentage of people who abused were the Silesians, the Maris brothers, and the Edmunds Christian brothers. What did we have in common? We taught boys, we ran boarding institutions. In France, the same. Involvement in schools, school camps, etc. So opportunity is clearly a factor. Father Kula knew that. And he writes to Champagne and says, the person you send me has to be somebody I can trust. <coughs> the rule of 1837, again, John, if you just read the black part, and I'll make a few comments. If children are ever in the house, they must be supervised. They will ensure that there is always a supervisor with the children. One never spends time with the child alone, no matter what the reason. One always does this in the presence of one of the brothers or at least four children. One never allows oneself any familiarity with them. It is required of whichever brother who is able to be a witness of such familiarities, be it with children or brothers, to inform the superior as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, John. There are two very fine Australian researchers called Smallbone and Watley, and they look at crime quite simply. And they say, for a crime to be committed, we need three things. Somebody who wants to commit the crime, a potential victim, and this is the key part, lack of guardianship or supervision. Let me give an example. When I was in Cameroon, sometimes I had to go from Bamenda to Douala to meet people at the airport and maybe do some shopping. If I parked the car, one or two boys would come up to me and say, we can protect your car. <clears throat> and the deal was, I would go away, they would stay with the car, when I came back I gave them some money. Because they knew there are people who would want to break into my car, I was a potential victim, and they could provide guardianship. 
They didn't need to do this German theoretical stuff in criminology to work that one out. And neither did Father Champagne. Wherever there's children, they must be supervised. Supervision is guardianship. The second one, never spend time with a child alone. Not just with two, not three, there must be four other children present. I wonder where you worked that one from. And the last one is about reporting. If you see something, you report. So way back in our tradition in 1837, Father Shepane had worked this out. And then my question, what happened to our tradition? <coughs> this is just a list that a German brother found of in Brother Avitz and Al de Maison. And I checked with Brother Andre and he said it's, it's correct. And these are places where abuse took place at different times. And he also a letter from a brother Sigisbert to Brother Avit. I must inform you that two years before I had been suspended as director because one of the assistants did something to a child. Mm -hmm. I've learned through a paper I came across by accident in communication with Andre. In the late 19th century, the anti clerical movement and the press jumped on such examples as part of their leverage against the church to embarrass the church and to make it difficult. However, they couldn't do that unless the case of abuse happened. And there were some cases, sadly, of Marvis Brothers. I know of allegations in France in the late 19th century, Germany going back to the 1930s. There was a case of a brother in the 1930s and he was sent to prison and then he was dismissed. There was a case of a priest spiritual director, not a brother, but associated with us, and two laymen. And the Nazi party used it to close eight institutions of the brothers in Bavaria. <coughs> I know of things going back to the 1930s in Belgium. One case, and this is just not an individual, a brother was found guilty of abuse by the local police, and they wanted him removed. Sadly, the superior general wrote and said, no, he has to finish his mandate as superior. Once he finished his three-year mandate, I've checked the records, he went to the province of saint paul to chateau and stayed there for eight years, then came back to France. And a brother said to me, oh, what they used to do was, if a brother in Belgium abused, they sent him to France. If a brother in France abused, they sent him to Belgium. Once things calmed down, they went back home. That speaks to me of a structural problem, not an individual, where we colluded in what Brother Sean Salmon called the geographic cure, moved from somewhere else. Case in the Scotland back to the 1950s, I found notes in an envelope, well, the archivist did, where the word sex and abuse were never mentioned, but it's very clear it was allegations of sexual abuse. In Ireland, going back to the 60s and the 70s, and those of you in this room know we have now learned in many other countries too. This slide I could spend a whole presentation on. But the point I want to make is that we have been very fortunate in the leadership of our institute in the area of responding to not just sexual abuse but abuse. Brother Charles Herbert and Brother Benito, he was Vicar General, Brother Charles wrote a letter to provincials in 1990 <coughs> saying there are sadly brothers who are abused. We have to make sure we care for the victim. We have to make sure we care for the brother. We have to report to the statutory authorities, etc. And then he said, I want every provincial to make sure your province has a safeguarding policy. I leave it to your imagination to ask if that happened. He sent another letter in 1993 on the same topic. Brother Benito wrote a very interesting letter because what he did was he made statements and said, this is a myth, it's not true, the reality is. So education is quite good because it takes your attention. He took a number of statements of abuse and said, these are not true. This is the truth. Brother Sean Salmon sent a whole letter to provincials about the topic of child sexual abuse. Sean was a psychologist and he worked with it. I was working as a 
therapist with both sex offenders and victims at the time, and Sean very graciously sent it to me before he published it. I made a few suggestions, which he very graciously included, and then it was sent out. In 2011, Brother Emili, he asked myself, John Klein and others, to prepare safeguarding guidelines for the Institute, which we did. And we said, you know, Brother Charles Howard tried that in 1990, and as far as we know, the only people who did it were the English speakers, because they had to do it anyway. Now, and we said to him, if you want this to make a difference, we suggest that you have a conference, bring all the provincials to Rome, and tell them to bring their safeguarding delegates. And they merely said to me, Brendan, they don't have safeguarding delegates. And I said, they will when you tell them to bring one. <laughs> and they did. And they had this 10-day workshop, which was a remarkable experience, uh, which I think was quite significant and transformative. There was another conference for the rights of children in 2016. And in 2017, the general chapter did a letter to victims of sexual abuse. And that letter was passed by 66 out of 76 delegates at the chapter. And again, Brother Ernesto, in his circular Homes of Light, refers to the, the painful topic of sexual abuse. And as far as I know, he's the first superior general to write to the whole institute and not simply to provincials. Brother Emili, in his bicentenary the video, has a section on victims of abuse. He talks about gratitude as an altar for our history. He asks forgiveness of those who have been hurt through abuse and makes a commitment to do what we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. I'd just like to look at the, the current statutes that were passed in our general chapter of 2017. And I'll ask John to read this, please. Statutes, child abuse, dismissal. The provincial or district leader shall recommend to the superior general the dismissal of any brother who is tried and convicted of sexual abuse. That includes convictions for producing, <coughs> accessing, or disseminating child abusive images or materials on the internet. Thanks, John. What's really important there, the internet is not a lesser kind of abuse. It's all abuse. Neglect is when a child's basic needs are not met. Now, I'll do this quickly because it's quite straightforward. Father Champagne's whole project was about combating educational and spiritual neglect. The whole Montana boy experience was his determination to do something. His interest was the education of poor children. We know that he wanted to do something for orphans who suffered from emotional neglect. He wanted the brothers to train to teach deaf children an awareness of disabled and marginalized children. He was interested in responding to an invitation from Bishop Devi to open an agricultural school for young men who lack skills. And his very last letter, very not specific, was to do something to further a project of a parish priest in Paris. It clearly wasn't a school, but it was for children who had particular needs. The constitutions are clear. The well-being, safety and protection of children and young people is the highest priority. Not an added extra the highest priority, and the personal responsibility of every mother's brother. The general chapter message was clear. Some mother's brothers have abused children. We apologize for these abuses. We will do what we can to make sure they never happen again. And our current policy takes us back to where we started and is faithful to St. Marcelin. It adds the perspective of children's rights and also the protection of adults in situations of vulnerability. The last thing I want to say before I finish with hopefully a bit of time for some questions is an important question. Does this history matter? Or is it simply people like me who love history who will go down any rabbit hole because it's interesting? 
Rabbi John needed a shir at the same time, and I took time to visit the novitiate, and I did some presentations to the 17 novices. And I did a version of this presentation, but beforehand I said to them, how many of you have had bad experience of physical punishment in school? You all put your hands up. Then I said, how many of you think the brothers should be able, or teachers should use physical punishment in school? Two thoughts put their hands up. I'm not very impressed. So then I did the presentation. Then I said, how many of you still feel we should use corporate punishment in modern schools? One thought put their hands up. That's not bad with a one-hour presentation. I got it down from two thoughts to one thought. <laughs> On the 12th of October, I did a webinar, 7 o'clock in the morning, with the Australian Malice Solidarity Network. People from Africa, Southeast Asia, Pacific. And I met Beck Bromhead, who was here for the FMSI meeting. And she said, Brendan, thank you for doing it. There are members of my staff who are not Catholics. And they said to me afterwards, we knew we had to follow the webinar, but we didn't think it would have much interest for us because it was Marist history. But once we heard the presentation, we realised how important it is. Because when any Marist partners are resistant to safeguarding, when they say it's just a bureaucratic imposition from charities in the West, we can say no. This is what it means to be Marist. This is intrinsic to the educational values of Marist and Champagne to protect children in those four areas. And the last point I want to make is building on Joel Carlos's presentation this morning when he said that prophetic leadership denounces social injustices. That includes the abuse of children. Thank you very much.